words from the wild. I say welcome back because all of the episodes you've seen up until now were actually filmed in April, before our children's programming team disbanded for a little bit because of COVID. But now we're back, and I'm excited to announce that Words from the Wild it has a new, full-length episode format, so you can expect a lot more content from me, all about nature. While I was away from work, we received lots of feedback about how much you guys are loving Words from the Wild, and that made me so happy. I also received one email asking if I knew the Krat Brothers. And if I didn't know the Krat Brothers, how did I get so smart about nature? Well, unfortunately, I don't know the Krat Brothers, although I wish that I did. I used to watch their old television shows, the live action one and Zaboomafoo in the early 2000s when I was a kid. But the question is, how did I get so smart about nature? So in today, our first full-length episode of Words from the Wild, we're going to take a slightly different approach. And instead of focusing on one specific animal or ecosystem, we're going to answer that question. How did I get smart about nature? And how can you get smart about nature right now from your own home? Are you ready? Let's get started. nature. Well, I never studied anything in school to teach me about animals. But when I was at university, I did take a few courses in what's called the earth sciences. We're going to be talking more about different kinds of natural science later in the episode, but suffice to say that I learned things about rocks, fossils, landforms like rivers and mountains, stuff like that. So if I didn't study it in school and I don't know the Krat brothers, how did I learn about nature? Well, it started when I was a kid, just like you. My brother and I got a bit of a push in starting to learn about nature, because both of our parents did study natural science when they went to university. This is my mom. My mom studied wildlife biology. This is my dad. My dad studied forestry. My parents loved nature so much that they wanted their kids to learn all about it. So we used to go camping all the time, we would go to Ontario Parks learning programs, and we also went to programs at our local library. My little brother and I loved exploring, and we had so many nature-based adventures. This is my younger brother and I, dip netting. Dip netting is when you're using a net to dip into a wetland and seeing what you can find. We found things like crayfish, frogs, dragonfly larvae, water bugs, etc. Now, if you're going to use a net like this, make sure to be very gentle, have clean hands, and always return the wildlife safely to where you found it. Here I am holding a baby snapping turtle. If you've been watching Words from the Wild already, you may remember my snapping turtle episode, and how I talked about how baby snapping turtles are harmless, and sometimes they even need our help getting to a safe place that they're trying to go to. Here we are in a canoe, on a hiking trail, here my brother and I are holding a garter snake that our dad found under the deck. He made sure that he showed us how to hold it properly and gently before he gave it to us. Wherever we went, whatever we did on the weekend, my family loved to learn, and we were always seeking out new ways to learn about nature. So yes, my parents did know a lot about nature, but these grown-ups in my life weren't the only way that I got smart about nature. Oh no, I had lots of questions growing up that my parents didn't know the answer to. How can you learn something when your grown-up doesn't know the answer? Well, I offer three ways. First, use the library. I mean, obviously, this is a library program, but really, I love the library. And as a kid, I took out and read every horse book that I think they had. KFPL is open again for curbside pickup. So you could put things on reservation uh, about a certain topic that you want to learn, and then your grown-up will get an email when it's time to come pick those up. The second option I recommend wasn't available to me as a kid, but now you guys have it at your fingertips, and that's the internet. Now you should never be using the internet without your grown-up's permission or supervision, depending on your age and the rules in your house. But if you are able to get on the internet, I would recommend using things like YouTube and Google to answer any question you might have. 
At the end of every Words from the Wild episode, I'm going to be offering a few child-friendly YouTube channels for nature education or education on whatever specific theme that we've covered that I think are awesome. You can also just take a few seconds to Google the answer to something. When I was growing up, we didn't have good internet, and so I couldn't do that. But now, if I have a question, it's as simple as opening my phone and typing that question into Google. The third option that I recommend for learning about nature is observation. Do you know what observation is? I'll give you a moment to brainstorm. Okay, have you got it? So an observation is something that we notice or observe about the world around us. We may observe that a woodpecker pecks its beak on a tree. Now from an observation that we make, can we draw a conclusion? Well, maybe you watch that woodpecker long enough that you see it eat a bug out of that tree. And you may think to yourself, hmm, well based on my observation, I think a woodpecker pecks on a tree to look for food. Making nature observations can be a little harder right now because we're all physically distancing and we're still isolating at home. But this is still something to keep in mind going forward. You can make observing nature part of your routine for the rest of your life. Making observations, recording those observations, and drawing conclusions from them is one of the main ways that natural scientists study nature. So you can be a naturalist in your own home just by recording the things that you've learned and trying to make sense of them. So, I hope that might have answered some of the question about how I got smart about nature and how you can too. Make sure to use the library's resources as well as all of the resources available to you, including the internet, YouTube, and nature itself. When the library opens up again, you can also come in and ask a library staff member about YouTube channels or website recommendations that are kid-friendly and have to do with nature. Librarians aren't just here for books. We're here to help you connect with the resources you need to learn. Hello and welcome to the In the Field segment of this week's Words from the Wild. Today I'm at Lemoyne Point Conservation Area and it's 6 a.m. Now remember, that going into the field is what scientists say when they're leaving their laboratory or their classroom and they're going out into the wild to do their research and to make their observations. So next time you go out into your backyard to look at birds or you're going out onto a hiking trail, you can say you're going into the field. <laughs> now why did I choose to come so early in the day? Well. Many animals are more active at dawn and dusk than they are during the day. Dawn is when the sun rises and dusk is when the sun sets. As I'm filming this, there are birds flying all around me and you can hear so many different bird calls. So as I'm going on this nature walk, we're going to be doing a lot of listening to all of the beautiful bird songs. <laughs> See that one right there? As you're walking, remember to look up. Sometimes we're so focused on what's in front of us, or side to side, we forget how much nature resides in the canopies of the trees. Look up as you're walking and find out how much really lives up there. squirrel. Alright, I stopped because I noticed this hole in this cut down stump. What do you think could have made the hole? I'll give you a minute to talk with your grown-ups about it. I think it was probably a woodpecker. Given the size of this hole, I bet it was a pileated woodpecker. The reason I stopped is because it's so fresh. How can you tell if a woodpecker hole is fresh versus old? Well, the color of the wood around the hole. See how bright and light colored this is? This hole was um, pecked through pretty recently. The older ones you'll see will be darker, dried out, and will have less fresh wood around it. So on the ground here you can see a pileated woodpecker. 
You can see him, he's looking up and down that tree, and it's searching all around for some tasty bugs, or a hollow log to maybe peck inside. These are wild turkeys, but uh, at Lemoyne Point, I think they've probably been fed by humans, which is why they're approaching us so boldly and so fearlessly right now, and displaying their tails as sort of a you know, hey, look at me, I'm very bold and uh, and strong and intimidating. Sort of a show. Hi, welcome back from the field. I wonder what kinds of observations you can make in the field this week. In our next segment, we're going to be learning a bunch of new science words. When you're trying to become a naturalist, it can be helpful to know the right kinds of words to describe to your friends and grown-ups what area of the natural world makes you really curious and excited. You will notice that most of these big, interesting words end with the sound ology. Ology means the study of something. If you want to know more about why that is, it has to do with Latin, and I invite you to look it up. First, we're going to start with what are called umbrella terms. They're called umbrella terms because they fit over a list of other more specific terms. Our two umbrella terms are earth sciences and biology. So, let's look under the umbrella of earth sciences first. Under the Earth Sciences umbrella, we have geology, which is the study of rocks, minerals, and Earth's history. We have meteorology, the study of weather. Volcanology, the study of volcanoes. Oceanography, it's the study of the ocean, but it's important to note it's not the animals that live in it. Oceanography is specifically the study of wave motion and, you know, different levels of salt in the water and things like that. The actual physical motions of the ocean. Astronomy is the study of outer space. Seismology is the study of earthquakes. That one might not sound like it makes sense. Seismology comes from seismic waves, which is the name for the vibrations in the Earth's crust that cause earthquakes. That's why it's called seismology. Geography is the study of land and place. Physical geography, specifically, is the study of landforms, like riverbeds, glaciers, mountains, and how they were formed. Paleontology, many of you probably know already. Paleontology is the study of fossils. There are other subsections of paleontology. Paleontology is a huge field on its own. Lastly, I've included mineralogy. Mineralogy is a subset of geology. It has to do specifically with studying minerals and their structures. Now, we're going to look under the biology umbrella. What you'll probably notice as soon as I put up this graphic is how many more fields of study there are in biology than earth sciences. And you know what? I didn't even include them all. I didn't even include half of them because there are so many diverse kinds of life on our planet, and there's a field of study for basically all of them. If you wanted to specialize in only looking at ferns, there's a word for that. It's philicology. But I didn't include those super specific ones, just so we could get through this. If I tried to include all of the studies of biology, that would be the whole program. All right, so let's take a look. Under the umbrella of biology, we have microbiology. That's the study of cells and, and things that you can only see under a microscope. Teeny tiny things. We have marine biology. That's the study of uh, animals and living things in the ocean. So it's different from oceanography, remember? Oceanography was the study of the motion of the ocean and the water itself and the forces of the ocean, whereas marine biology is the living things in the ocean, like whales and plankton and the octopus. Then we have botany. Botany is the study of plants. Dendrology is a kind of botany that focuses only on trees. Dendrologists study trees. Ornithology is the study of birds. Entomology is the study of insects. 
Primatology is the study of primates, like chimpanzees, orangutans, and gorillas. Mammalogy is the study of all mammals. So, primatology that I just mentioned is a kind of mammalogy, because primates are mammals. Mycology is the study of fungi. You'll see I've included a picture of some mushrooms there. Ichthyology is the study of fish. Herpetology is the studies of reptiles and amphibians. I've included a picture of a snake there. Carcinology is the study of crustaceans. A lot of people have never heard of this one. Carcinologists study things like crabs and lobsters and other shellfish. Malacology is similar, but not the same. It's the study of mollusks. I did a Words from the Wild program on mollusks before. Some of you may have been there. Mollusks include things like slugs, snails, uh, sea snails, the octopus, um, the nautilus, things like that. Arachnology is the study of arachnids, so that it mostly includes spiders. Yes, there are scientists whose whole life is dedicated to studying spiders. Finally, I've listed ecology and zoology. Ecology is the study of ecosystems, so that's all kinds of life in a system, in a connected network. And ecology is the study of how those things connect and work together within their system. And finally, zoology is also kind of an umbrella word. I've included it at the end um, just because you'll probably hear it. Um, and it, it's just the study of animals as well. All right, so that is our whole biology umbrella. And as I said, there are so many more words. And you might think it sounds really complicated now. We have our earth sciences, we have our biology, we have all of these kinds of study underneath them. But you know what? Every week, as I do Words from the Wild, I'm gonna bring this graphic back. And I'm gonna zero in on what fields of study the things we talk about that week are going to fall under. By the end of the summer, I bet you will know some of these words, and I bet you'll be able to tell your grown-ups what field of study most interests you. Okay, well that concludes our first episode of Words from the Wild. Your challenge this week has to do with observations and data, just like we've been talking about. Your challenge is to record some sort of natural observation data, whether you make that uh, birds from your window without leaving your house, smaller wildlife in your backyard, or something you see out on a walk. The idea is to notice something about the way they look, the way they behave, and then remember that. If you want to join us on our live Words from the Wild, which is going to be on Monday afternoons, make sure to register for that, to share with me your observations, to meet other wild-minded kids, and to enjoy some nature-based books. This program continues to be a work in progress, but I'm so excited to see what we find next week. Bye! Stay wild, everyone! <laughs>